hopeful to have the technical capabilities today to show the films we've been doing inside OMRA, but uh, that perhaps will be another program in the future. Uh, seeing is believing. Very, very important. And uh, as a person who got involved with the subject of OMRA when I was a student more than 40 years ago, it's an issue which is so clear as a central issue to solving any peace deal in the future. Now, this week, the Israeli government made history when the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Ron Prosor, addressed a symposium at the UN on Monday that dealt with UNRWA policies. Prosor declared that UNRWA's policy of maintaining Arab refugees and their descendants in a situation of perpetual refugee status represents a threat to peace in the Middle East. After many years of fence setting, the government of Israel took a stand against UNRWA education as it is. Now, what, what is education? There's the schoolroom, and there's the atmosphere around the schoolroom. Behind me are, are, are murals near and around the schools in Dahisha. We sent our staff, which is just south of Bethlehem, the UNRWA facility. We sent our staff to take pictures there because someone from one of us said not to worry, when the Pope comes next week to the Asia, these murals won't be there. Now that's not the first time we've heard that. There are murals that glorify those who commit acts of murder. Now, from our agency's examination of the 150 new school books that have been introduced into the Oliver school system, we can discern a systematic war education curriculum not a hate education curriculum, per se, but a war education curriculum that prepares students to follow the four ideals. And this is all this is in our book here, which you'll see, which just came out last week. We take voluntary contributions for it, not here, because it's not kosher to do it here. But you, you have my business card, stay in touch with us. That's how we finance what we do. But there's four principles we were able to discern. One, the right of return by force of arms. Two, a commitment to a jihad to liberate all of Palestine. Three, dedication to the act and ideal of homicidal martyrdom. And four, denial of the legitimacy of the state of Israel and demonization of Israel. It's very important to see the school books for what they are, which is why in the book here, in the book here we have segments of the school books. When we were here last time in March, met with, with staffers of the UN and U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We brought the people who did this, the, the, the translations of the school books. And we had all the school books there. Now we have, have, have uh, three copies of all of the books. And they speak for themselves. I don't accept the idea that Palestinian Arabs are incapable of promoting peace. There is a peace curriculum waiting to be implemented that was prepared at Bears Lake University which is not the Zionist aid. However, it was vetoed by the Palestinian Authority and by UNRWA. It doesn't have to be that way. I don't accept, as I heard from the one speaker at the forum on Monday, about UNRWA policies. Well, that's their, that's their culture. That's not acceptable. That's almost racist against the Palestinian Arabs, as if they're not capable of promoting peace. That's not the case. It's just that one element the Palestinian Arab community has been promoted rather than another one. Now, drilling into the minds and hearts of Woodward students that the illegal settlements of Israel are those Jewish communities that replaced Arab villages that existed before 48. The maps that are issued indicate every village was uprooted with a handy computer program called palestinerenumbered.com so that every child in each one of the facilities knows that he or she has a personal obligation to liberate their homes and villages from the 448. And this is also going to be an aspect of lawfare in the near future. Uh, litigation. Thanks to careful research on the other side, showing exactly where homes, where homes and villages were, where people lived, and instead of moving towards the future, always dealing with the past. Now, UNRWA education 
is not financed by the United Nations nor by Arab countries. This is actually a positive thing to say. The Fund of Education is fully backed by Western nations, and they can be held accountable. But these Western nations, especially the U.S., could easily condition funds to UNRWA on cancellation of a curriculum which defies UN principles of peace. Those of us who grew up, I grew up in the United States, I've been in this for a long time, but we remember how United Nations Day, October 24th, was almost a holiday. United Nations out of arms with flags unfurled. The concept of, of, of a symbol of peace, and indeed, the UNRWA slogan is, peace begins here. So since even some of the funding for UNRWA in Gaza for education comes in hard U.S. currency at the request of UNRWA, and, and that makes accountability somewhat impossible. That doesn't mean that citizens of the United States and other Western countries cannot call for accountability. Several times in the last 10 years, our agency has asked USAID about education. The response we got 10 years ago was, well, there's always been studies done by the State Department. We discovered the studies were done by uh, lobbies pro-Arab and submitted to the State Department. The, the State Department didn't do their own studies. And we got a, got a very terse comment in 2010, USAID does not examine UN education. In 2013, when our legal counsel sent a note to the to, and I have a copy of the letter we said that was sent, a very reasonable request of USID to oversee and to reevaluate whether aspects of the curriculum that promote war should be reconsidered, not even a response, not the courtesy of a response. Exactly 12 years ago, our agency came here to D.C. after, excuse me, 11 years ago, after the UNRWA unions of teachers and administrators were taken over by Hamas in Gaza. And Congressman Chris Smith, working with Congressman Elliot Engel, proposed legislation which, which became law that any refugee agency that has bona fide terrorists as an aspect of the agency, will lose U.S. funds. So the issue 11 years later, since it is law, this is law, what's happening to the implementation of that law? Considering the fact that Hamas, as we show in our book, Hamas also organizes something called kutla clubs. In Hebrew, we have the word katel, the katel, to murder. Kutla clubs in each of the order schools preparing children for a life of terrorist activity. Now, one entity that examined the new PA UNRWA textbooks was the Vatican, whose September 2000 report asserted that the new PA UNRWA school, PA school books used in UNRWA are not other than the manuals for war, a conclusion which caused Italy to withdraw funds from PA education. And that story in itself was so similar to what we're seeing today. The Pope, and how did this all began in terms of, of, of getting them the, the getting the Vatican the new school books? In the spring of 2000, Pope John Paul II was coming to the Middle East, and Arafat issued a memo that he was going to endorse the right of return. So I was in a dialogue group between religious Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And we knew Pietro Salvi, Archbishop of Salvi, who at the time was the um, uh, okay, uh, who at the time was a um, was the ambassador of the Pope in, in Jerusalem. And I passed on to what our folks said that, that, that when that he came to refugee camps, he was going to endorse refugee right every time. So I got a thank you. Uh, when an Orthodox Jew gets a thank you from the Pope, it's very interesting. That's almost mm -hmm. newsworthy. And uh, that, you know, he, the Pope made sure everyone would understand that it was endorsement of UN resolutions, not the resolution for right of return. So we developed a chemistry. And uh, Archbishop Sami had a great sense of humor. He said, we owe you one. Okay. 
that in August 2000, I had interviewed Nasser Arafat. Arafat had said there was going to be new schools for peace, which would especially would be used in the honor games. So I met with, on August 1st, 2000, with the Palestinian Authority Minister of Education. His name was Nabi, and it was um, Abu Humus, making a straight face with a name like that. And uh, Naim Abu Humus gave us permission to buy the school books. At the time, the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs was not really interested. And I got a call from the uh, from, from uh, Archbishop Zambi how interested the Pope was in seeing the books. And he said something which I had, which I was asked not to use in, in, as a reporter. I can say it orally, and uh, journalists who are here, I would ask not to use this in a, uh, in, a, in a news story. But he said he was very interested in seeing the school books of the Palestinian Authority because he was worried that the PLO reminded him of Nazi Germany because he had been, as you know, a priest in Poland during the Nazi occupation. He was very worried about the incitement. And when the Vatican did see the books and we provided them for, the, for, for Archbishop Saudi, the determination that this is a curriculum of war, and one doesn't have to blame UNRWA for that, because UNRWA is using PA education, PA school books. But one can ask UNRWA to, to be discerning when books are handed them. Now, UNRWA policies contrast with UNHCR policies, which encourage refugees to get on with their lives. Now, something very important, and this is a positive aspect of our work. We just sent a journalist to Jordan. We're preparing a new film. We've done, we produced 12 films, and so I understand we do have the te technology to show one of them today. UNHCR is handling the refugees who have fled from UNRWA camps in Jordan, in, in Syria, and UNRWA, UNHCR is helping them and making a noble effort to locate nations that will be able to, to absorb the 140,000 refugees who now wallow in makeshift facilities in Jordan. That is impressive. That's important. It's important to emphasize that this new generation of refugees being handled by UNHCR are not being taught the inherent right of return to Palestine. The model of Chile is being examined as, examined as a nation which had adopted legislation which affirms the citizenship and benefits of any client of UNRWA who, who emigrates, em, emigrates to, to Chile. Now, I want to go back for a moment to the pictures behind me because the, the UNRWA, we heard that all of the murals would be wiped out before the Pope would come to the Haitian. Well, let's see if that happens. They're here. They're very clear in terms of what their message is. Because it's not only the right of return, but the right of return through the what they call the armed struggle. Now, the time has come to encourage legis legislatures of donor nations to adopt what, 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 we, what in our agency we're calling an owner reform initiative. And that's four aspects to it. Reasonable aspects. One, not to use texts or teachers who encourage children to engage in acts of war. Number two, to stop support for designated foreign terrorist entities such as Hamas within UNRWA. Legislation, as I mentioned before, already exists on the books in the EU, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, Great Britain. It's a matter of getting these, 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 these laws to be enforced. And, and number three, desist from promoting the right of return by force of arms. And number four, adopt internationally accepted UNHCR definition of refugee status and not to bequeath refugee kid status on the descendants of refugees from 65 years ago. It gets a little absurd. And it's like an almost an Orwellian statement. There are there are refugees, and then there are you know special refugees. Two practical suggestions: sponsor new films of one of our facilities, which which speak for themselves. In the era of YouTube's, there's so much going on with the one rate youngsters filming themselves. We don't, we don't only have to send in crews to get the job done, because seeing is believing. Who would believe that such things are taught in their schools, in their summer camps, if we didn't film it? And last but not least, 
I'm here today on my own. I happen to be here. I'm very pleased to be here. But it's very important to bring people who speak Arabic, who have done the translations, who have gone over the, 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 all of the details of the translations to show exactly what is going on. They are the people with credibility, people who have PhDs in Islamic studies, Arabs and Jews, to be able to dialogue with people who are making legislation today. It's not a hard thing to do. Arabic is not a rocket science. What you'll see in our new book, the two middle sections, the only <coughs> education, is chapter and verse in terms of what's being taught. So I don't expect this to be necessarily an attack on UNRWA but rather a suggestion to a humanitarian agency, and I'm speaking also as an MSW, a humanitarian agency to resume its position as a, human, as a humanitarian agency, and not as an agency which is basically aligning itself with the PLO, whose purpose remains war with Israel, because that's their mandate as established by the Arab League. We have time for a, for a video, please. This is your CD. What we'll do now is just see a, uh, a few a few snippets from our filming of classrooms in the Palestinian authorities, the Palestinian Authority schools, which are run inside UNRWA facilities. Very important. I wanted just while you're putting that on, to the two, some of the few people who get credit for getting, a, getting our agency to start this issue. First, there was a rabbi named Eugene Wiener, as I mentioned in my book. He came to my high school in 1968. I was a senior in high school at Akiva in Philadelphia. And he said, the refugees are our responsibility now. And I think we have to take that seriously because before 67, they, they weren't in our control. Second, a gentleman from Washington named Dr. Joseph Lerner, who was here for, uh, he worked in a very high position in the White House, and he recognized the importance of dealing with the UNRWA issue, and uh, he commissioned our first report, which was published in May 1988. And a member, two members of Knesset, who were um, involved in UNRWA reform in the 80s, which unfortunately at that time was, um, was vetoed by the U.S. and other donor nations member of Knesset in Nova Eliyahu, who has passed away, and Mordecai Ben Parat, who is still alive at the age of 93, who was an Iraqi Jew, who spoke Arabic, and he actually was able to gain the confidence of the people in the Arab refugee camps uh, to try to relocate or to establish the camps as, as permanent facilities. Uh, and um, in, his, in his short book, he shows how the Western nations interfered the basic issue of UNRWA reform, that uh, UNRWA, UNRWA um, residents could, instead of becoming a permanent uh, a refugee for, for perpetuity, could be resettled in decent, home, decent places, both in the Middle East and abroad. Our graph doesn't show, but we have a phenomenal researcher who just joined our staff and who next, is in our, will be for our next book about the extent to which Islamic organizations have begun to uh, pour money into UNRWA, into extracurricular activities, but that's that's more or less a, uh, how should I say, a, a preview for a, com for a coming attraction for what our next book will look like. Right now, we're focusing on one thing. We're here on Capitol Hill. These books, nice for, for my friends to read, or my, some of you are old friends, but the key thing is to bring them to the attention of the people who make decisions. I heard from Steve Rosen the other day when we were at this forum on uh, UNRWA policies. And Steve was also an expert, as you may know, in APAC. He said that he, there are six different congressional committees, six, that have to make decisions as far as UNRWA. Two of them are appropriations, two of them are government operations, two of them are foreign relations committees. And what we find is a tremendous ignorance level. And if you look on the UNRWA website, you would think that, that everything is peaches and cream. Uh, the UNRWA website the last few weeks has been showing uh, um, 
handicapped children coming to school. Well, you know, who can object to that? We're not saying that they're not helping handicapped children go to school. But there's something in addition going on here. Something which is clear, something which is open, something which we in the world of investigative journalism, we don't have to look under the beds and under uh, for any conspiracy that is right out there. We went with the permission of the Palestinian Authority and, and we, we purchased the new school books. And they're sitting in my office in Jerusalem, if anyone has a question. And we handed them to the Prime Minister's office. And the Prime Minister was a little shocked because he had gotten other information that wasn't in there. And the Prime Minister immediately began to use our work. It speaks for itself. All it has to do, in this case, is say, you want further funding? Great. You're, you're an agency that handles refugees and the descendants of refugees, but there are some conditions. And everything is a matter of whether you speak up and whether you are in touch with the staffers of Congress who can make a difference. And just as 11 years ago, when a group of us came with the facts of the Hamas takeover of, of the uh, of the, of the uh, labor unions inside UNRWA in Gaza. And there was an immediate legislative initiative on both sides of the aisle, and we succeeded in getting a piece of legislation passed, which is on the books now, I can emphasize. So I just want to say that when you live in Israel, you have to have a little sense of optimism. One of my friends whose English isn't so good, he says, optimism, oh, hope to me. It's up to me. I'm a believer. Oh, my, my first visit to the Hill was to wish Hubert Humphrey happy birthday in 1965. Because uh, there were many, many heroes who inspired uh, America with a moral sense. And it was actually this day, 1967, that I had the pleasure of meeting Robert Kennedy when he said, I'd rather be an idealist without illusions than be an illusionist without ideals. So again, there's a whole generation of people who inspired, in a sense, our generation. I guess I'm not Gigi anymore, whatever those who say. But a whole generation of people who, who worked on moral principle. And moral principle is what we're talking about here. There's no reason why they should be identified with one camp or another, with one aspect of the political arena or another. This is a consensus issue. And speaking as a social work professional, the worst thing you can say in the world of social work is when you say something is inappropriate. That's maybe you call the word worst thing you can say. And it's inappropriate for an agency to say to its clients, your homes are waiting for you in 48, from 48, and that's why you're in these decrepit positions. You can challenge them and say, hey, the Palestinians have just built a city near Uwega, right near Ramallah. We can just interview the, the uh, godfather of that city and of Al Nasri, who made it very clear that even though they raised the money from USAID and other independent charities and, and government charities around the world to, to solve the demographic problem of the Palestinians, there will be no one from UNRWA, from the UNRWA facilities, welcome to live there because they have their homes waiting for them from 48. Now, my friends, that's, that's what we call inappropriate. I was there once coming. So perhaps we'll have some questions, and, and uh, we do have representatives here from one word today. Perhaps they have some questions or some apples to throw at my head or anything. Anyone, anything is acceptable. We have follow that up. The follow-up is that Hillary Clinton gave testimony on three occasions that she assured everyone that there's no member of the Taliban on the staff of one we have it in the Congressional Research or the Research Service, and she apparently has a sense of humor because the Taliban is in Afghanistan. That is a vital issue to follow up, and uh, congressmen such as uh, Chris Smith and, and uh, Elliot Engel should be following up, uh, Kirk should be following up, everyone should follow it up, because if Hamas openly says we're there, and they don't hide it, you see, that's the advantage of our work, they don't hide anything, they're there. They have very high profile, profile, and they, they, this is, it is, it is simply a criminal act. And as you may know, because of the latest Palestinian Authority Hamas reconciliation deal, which basically was, was etched in stone back in December 1995, no one wanted to say that, and when we produced a movie on this subject, no one wanted to pay attention. But let me give you a hint. 
You know the difference between a genius and a crackpot? A genius is a step ahead of his time, a crackpot is two steps ahead of his time, so you decide which one I am. But the point is, at that time, no one wanted to pay attention to it. It's there. It's there for the taking. It's there for the legislating. It's there for, 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 for litigation. And there are high officials in the American government that I, I um, I'd rather not say who, but there are high officials in the American government who agree the way to be pushed. I have had an off the record and staffers that we work with have off the record meetings with the Department of Justice who handle issues of counterintelligence. They're waiting to be pushed. And when Steve Rosen, when he, who was an expert of legislation, when he was asked, why this didn't go through, there's not enough people making it into an issue. Now, I'm the guy, you'll be surprised, but I studied with a man named Saul Alinsky. <laughs> and I did not study with the Alinsky Foundation like a certain president did. And Mr. Alinsky said to us, students at the University of Wisconsin, a problem is a problem when someone makes it into a problem. And my master's thesis is dedicated to, to, to that gentleman. And he's not from there, and, and I want to remind you, this is the day of me endorsing the Vatican, but the Vatican hired Mr. Olinsky to, to counter the communists around the world, and it's not something that's appreciated. A problem is a problem when someone makes it into a problem. And there's a very important official in the uh, world of Congressional legislation who said to, to me and to my friends many years ago that if 10 people make an issue out of something, and 10 people, send, 10 people send us a reasonable letter, we go into a tizzy. Is this not a real, are these not reasonable issues? Now, again, it's not as sensational as we'd like to. A certain right wing friend of mine in Israel would not, would not review my book because it was too constructive. He, he, he was expecting me to, <laughs> to recommend the or napalm or something like that on, on, on Monroe, which is not exactly our best style, I mean, please. But again, you don't have to napalm anybody when you, we're talking about the basic issue of reform. And the issue of defunding Monroe is simply inappropriate. It's not going to happen in any social service agency, even if you find it, whatever. The issue of social reform, that's what we're talking about. There is, I, I can tell you that we've been interfacing with government, U.S. government officials, European government officials, the absolute ignorance of these issues from very, very important people who have integrity and who are professional, they do not know the issue. They do not know the issue. There's also, look, there are certain Israeli officials who, who at the beginning of the Oslo process said, don't worry, there's been an understanding that, that uh, the right to return issue is in Syria, so it's not going to happen. I don't want to mention Yossi Bailey's name, but he was the key person to say that Yossi Bell, who was the Deputy Foreign Minister, and I'm not the Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel, and he has had some credibility, but he said the deal has been worked out, that this issue has been abandoned. And there is, there is another gentleman who, who, who's, who actually, I mentioned before that Bears State University has a peace curriculum which rejects right of return, and there's a gentleman very high in the Israeli government who's been saying over and over and over that that's the curriculum that was adopted by the Palestinian Authority. That gentleman's name is Shimon Peres. Now, Mr. Perez is the president of Israel, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to use the shaker word or liar word, but it's just there's a certain issue here of, of, of the people in, in the highest level of the Israeli government over the years have said this isn't an issue. And that's what one of the issues that now, that finally, finally, the Prime Minister of Israel is making the issue of the curriculum into an issue. It took a long time, but as of the last few weeks, it's now an issue. And as of Monday of this week, Monday of this week, the Israel Foreign Ministry has made a decision. It has crossed the Rubicon. But the level of ignorance in the Foreign Ministry of Israel, let alone the State Department, is beyond anyone's imagination. And our job, as we try to say sometimes, is let my people know. <laughs> my people do not know this issue at all. And that's, all I can, uh, that's what I can tell you. So, and I'm talking about people in governments. Begin, begin with people in governments, because the, the, the feel-goodism of being assured all the time sometimes, unfortunately, has a very, very negative effect. And there's also another philosophy, is that so long as UNRWA is doing business with Israel, it must be good. In my estimate is UNRWA must spend between $100 and $2 million on Israeli products. So there's a, you know, happy days are here again. So that doesn't mean that business translates into a, a desire for reconciliation. 
there's a desire for gasoline and, 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 and Tanuva and other Israeli products, and that doesn't mean peace. That doesn't mean reconciliation. And also, I want to be very clear about something. In terms of how we articulate the issue, as a social work professional, I meet with these kids. I do not sense hate education. My cameraman, Constantine Cameraman, who recently passed away, he said to me, and, and he was he was and he wasn't kidding, he says, Don't worry, my kids don't hate you, they just want to kill you. I felt <laughs> so reassured. <laughs> but understand something. There was something to that joke because I was a little worried when this kid was singing hip hop and he went around the house while he was, you know, how how we're gonna kill the Jews while he's gonna give me kosher cookies. He says, he doesn't mean you, I mean, what am I chopped liver? The whole point is that, is that they have understood not to inculcate hate education, but war education. There's a difference. Because they basically appreciate what's the dream of many, many Palestinians, to have a Palestinian state and, and, a, and an Israeli identity guy. Right? You'll, you'll hear that a lot. But here, something else is going on. And the Palestine Security Force, which has never cooperated with Israel on matters of security, but yes, on matters of, of, criminal, of, of uh, uh, criminal issues, yes. The fear is that they will be involved in any future conflict, in any future armed, armed struggle. It's very, very important. And many, many people who trusted the issue of, of, of weapons trading with the, with the Palestinian Authority are going to be very embarrassed. There's a lot of people who are very embarrassed. A lot of people have hate on their faces. Three days before his death, Mr. Rabin told me I was a great pain in a certain part of his anatomy. Because we were showing from Capitol Hill what Arafat was saying in Arabic. And he felt that was undermining the peace process. Well, we were just doing the, the, the saying the truth. And people had, would ask us often, why don't you put out what they say for peace in the Arabic language? And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not Walt Disney. I'm sorry, but we don't invent what we'd like to see. Fairy tales can be untrue, they can happen. Well, first of all, they're worse. Uh, the Jordanian and Egyptian textbooks were censored by Israel in 1967. When I interviewed Teddy Kulik on the 30th anniversary of the Six Day War, I said, what was the most traumatic thing you remember the Six Day War? And what is the first thing he said without any hesitation was their school books. Five, you know, five dead Jews and three Jews, dead Jews is eight dead Jews, things like this. And the Israeli, the, the, Israel, the, new, the newly established Israel Defense, Israel Civil Administration tore apart the books and then put in censored school books, which were always under supervision until 1994. In 1994, the censored, the, 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 there was a decensor, the, the PA decensored the books from Egypt and Jordan with the funding of the Dutch, of the, of the Dutch government. We did a, we filmed them as they were putting back into the censored issues, the issues that had been censored, because their new books didn't come out until 2000. Now, Israel, if you recall, on October 26, 1994, Israel signed a peace agreement with Jordan. And one of the fundamental important clauses of, of that peace agreement was that there would be peace education, uh, and that Jordan would cancel all the incitement, and they never did. And uh, Israel's never insisted on it, and that's the way it is. Uh, so that the next generation of Jordan is, is unfortunately a war-educated war generation even if the leadership of the Hashemite kingdom are friendly. Now, again, I wanted to say something positive about Jordan right now. Again, Jordan is receiving people who are, who are fleeing from Syria. They're not emphasizing the right of return to Palestine. They could have done that. They could have done that. They're not doing it. So that's something positive. We just had a journalist who, who went to uh, the, these new, new camps. We could not take pictures, could not take films. But that's the impression we have. It's a positive impression. Up. And uh, one of our films, we show what happened when we sent a delegate to Chile to witness the re reception given in Chile to the people who had, had to leave for UNRWA facilities in, in, in Iraq and were received in Chile because they had nowhere to go and how well they were received there. So these are precedents. They are positive precedents. I'm sorry to be constructive. But that's very important. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, somebody is. Sarah, please. Well, David, um, were you saying that within the UNRWA camps in Jordan, they are not teaching the right no, no, the to new, the Syrian new, refugees? No, 
uh, the Syrian refugees, the Syrian refugees. That's all. And that could, again, it, there could have been, a, Jordan could have insisted on it, they did not insist on it. And my Arab representative who was there for several days and who knows Arabic and who was able to go into the schools and everything like that. So the toll is a different atmosphere, an atmosphere of trying to solve the issue. So these issues can be solved. You don't have to be, there's an expression often used by my colleagues, oh, no, wait till the political process is finished. Well, I, I wear a kippah not only because of my bald spot, because I do believe in the in, in Mashiach. But I, that doesn't mean we don't do things before Mashiach arrives. I, I don't. And if the other people, if the other people here today would like to address the subject, I honestly can't address it. I just can just say that from my point of view, these are allegations, which I don't know if they're founded or unfounded. I have no idea. But if the people here from Lebanon would like to address it, I, I, uh, again, to be uh, fair. Um, but certainly, uh, the UNRWA website, UNRWA.org, is a place to write to them, but we have people from UNRWA here today that they want to relate to. Them. Who's here from UNRWA? Who's here from UNRWA? Would you address that issue? Well, I'm not here to address every issue. Sorry, I we have universal, uh, universal vaccination of all the children in the United States. You're saying that there is universal vaccination of the children. Um, all I can say is, I, don't, I have to say, in all due modesty, uh, if I haven't checked something out, I can just say that it's, it's an allegation. There was allegations in the school books. There was, a, there was a, a PR firm that went around. There's a PR firm run by a man named Daniel Levy, who happens to be the co co founder of, of J Street. Who also is, is involved in Americans, American Friends of Lebanon, who put out the statements in many, many organizations that the new school books were happy days are here again. So we went through the expense, we had to raise the funds, buy the books, to <laughs> translate to see what was there, what was there. And we found that it wasn't happy days are here again. Well, that did Daniel leave. But um, that's the thing. I've getting, I, I asked many times the people in J Street to have the opportunity to share the school books with them. In all fairness, there are some people on the left here in Washington, notably by uh, David Saperstein and his crew, who have carefully looked at our material and have issued memos to the liberal members of Congress to please take our serious kind of material very seriously. Congressman Al Green of Houston, who has thoroughly gone through this material, who was assured by Fayad, Solomon Fayad, that there were new school books, but, but he didn't count on something else. The day that Fayad told him that there were new school books and new Changes was the same day we interviewed the new Palestinian Minister of Education, who said he was she was under orders from Fayad not to change the books. So I publicly confronted him at the in, in, in other congressmen in, in, uh, when they came to Jerusalem, and ever since Al Green, Congressman Al Green has been looking at this material. Again, it's right there. It's not the it, it, reading Arabic is not a rocket rocket science. It's there. But again, in response to some of the things that have been said today, also the ignorance level. The amount of people who reassure, who reassure the State Department. There's a gentleman named Martin Indyk, perhaps the name is familiar to you, <laughs> uh, and another one named David Makovsky, who, 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 who at the time was at the time a close friend. But these people go around saying that, that the education system, and Mr. Makovsky, in response to my question at the APAC, last year said the education is not important. So uh, these are the people who are advising, advising uh, Secretary Kerry. I don't blame Kerry, I blame Indyk and, and uh, Mikowski for, for uh, misleading them. Education is not important. Thank you. That's, that's very, very important because that has to be addressed. The same people we're working with who, who, who evaluated the Arab school books have also evaluated the Israeli school books. Uh, my colleagues hired uh, a gentleman who's, who spent his career as part of Peace Now. He was also an academic and expert in education. And he made his presentation of 300 Israeli school books where he looked for xenophobia, hatred in the books. And it was a very, very important seminal meeting at the Truman Center. The whole uh, contingent of peace now was in the front row waiting for He says, I'm sorry, I couldn't find any. So the spokesman of peace now said, well, can you, what, have you, what have you done to us? He said, am I supposed to invent some books to make you look happy? Point is that when Amos, we'll be pleasant in a second, Amos put that out. It was a series of academics who put who looked 
very carefully at the school, books that are taught in government schools, religious and non-religious government, government schools. And yes, you have the issue of recognizing the Arabs as people that Israel's at war with. But issues of Islam, the Arab community, understanding of, of uh, the, one of the fo foci of the curriculum in Israel is how to get along with the Arab neighbor, and both of the religious and the non-religious school system. Now, are there issues that need to improve? Of course there are. But we're talking about apples and oranges in terms of, of, of a system which says that Israel's, I mean, I, I'm not giving all the examples that are in the book here, but the issue of the jihad, again, the jihad, liberation of all of Palestine, uh, every Israeli, again, in some of you, you may, the next question might be about the maps. No, I, actually, just, just, but let me just yeah. mention something about the maps, which is very important. I, I left my maps in, in the Union Station. Why am I a silly guy? Uh, <laughs> that's usually part of what I put up. The Israeli maps, all Israeli maps since January 1st, 9, 2000, always must indicate by law the areas that have been ceded to the Palestinian Authority. All Palestinian Authority maps issued since that time, not only do not, not show Israel, but every Palestinian city, every Israeli city becomes a Palestinian city. That's all part of the deal. First things first, you have a situation of war. I mean, let's go over a few, few very interesting facts. In the last 12 years, there have been 31,000 aerial attacks from Gaza. And the 1.7 million people in Israel live under that threat. And therefore, they're not in love with the people of Gaza. And will say nasty things when, you, when they wake up in the morning about the Arabs of Gaza. And that's, and, and, and the, certainly the children will, teenagers will, of course they will. That's part of the deal. When you're at war, you do not, you do not sing love, love songs about people who are fire at you. Number two, because Israel has put its troops on the ground in just about every place in the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, we've had a lot less terror attacks. However, we have a whole traumatized world out there who have not recovered from the period of time when every other day there was a bus blowing up uh, and um, I know what happened to my own children, how they were affected. My wife was working for nine years with families whose loved ones were murdered. And everyone knows someone who, who was murdered or injured. So you don't have the love affair that, what, that could have been and the good relations that could have been. But I want to tell you, when Jody Roder, the New York Times correspondent, in her first week in Israel, she was looking for something newsworthy, so some, some, for some reason she asked me. I said, how about coming to Hebron? And, and, and uh, there's a monthly meeting between the Arab sheikh and the Jewish community there. It doesn't get in the media because it's not, it doesn't fit the script. That was one of her first stories about Sheikh Jabri and Noam or Noam. Again, it's not something that fits the script. Also, we very often, what I do, I, what I do for a living, I, I, I uh, escort journalists, you know, that's the, uh, some people escort other, other uh, entities, I escort journalists. And <laughs> there is a difference. But I take them to, amongst other things, I say, look, let's go to the, super, the three supermarkets where there's Jews and Arabs who do shopping together. I sit back, you do your story. <laughs> and it's an amazing story. Uh, it's always an amazing story. There's negatives and positives about Jewish Arab relations. Issues of, of uh, prostitution of Jewish girls with Arab fellows in Jerusalem ever since the light rail opened up is a very, very tra traumatic, awful story. Because where I work in the center of Jerusalem is next to a place that all young people get in, and uh, the issue of pigs coming out of the Arab world, out of the Arab sections of Jerusalem, and picking up the Jewish teenagers, and the Jewish teenagers don't come back. And there's many, many issues going on between Jewish Arab relations. So it's a complicated issue. I've been involved with it my whole career, 44 years. Uh, my, I, we had a rabbi named Rabbi Nathan Fruman who did amazing things to uh, bring people together. He brought people together to, to meet our five. There's about 15 organizations that deal with that. 15. That deal with, that try to, to um, deal with issues of, of improving relations with Jews and Arabs and especially because Jews are more sensitive to Arab needs. Uh, rabbi Eugene Weiner, who I mentioned in the first, but the first page of the book, he started the Abraham Fund, which does exactly that. So it's, it's a cottage industry in Israel.
But uh, again, it's also become a very naive industry because when I ask them, let's take a look at the school books, they say, we'd rather not have you call us on those issues. Because the, uh, the ability of, of some of our, our colleagues in the Palestinian world to just lie and say it's not there, but here, here it is, here's what's in the books. Um, when I asked Arafat about it, he says, oh, I, I, there's, it's going to be changed. And that's how I got to get, get the books, because Arafat gave me permission. As a matter of fact, I did not know the letter that he gave me, which says, I work for Yasser Arafat, and therefore I can go to the school books, and the school books wants to get books. And I didn't know I had that in him as, as a client. <laughs> I, just, I had no idea, because my staff is there, but I don't. When I challenged him, he says, it's going to be changed. And when we, when we went there, we found there was a, just like, we were also the, we were also the agency that would cover the fact that the PLO covenant was never canceled. Because we had an Arab TV crew, we sent them in, they, they filmed what was, there was a switch. So in, in August 1st, 2000, the Berzai University curriculum that parents have spoken about all the time was simply not implemented. And Mr. Perez has yet to say, excuse me for that. He, uh, he has another 30 years to go in order to openly, uh, Make amends for certain inaccuracies and stuff he said. So, anyway, the bottom line is our hope is to produce more material. People we know who would like to work with us, because of the hey, that's great, foundations, whatever. Uh, people we know who are going to uh, acquire books so that we, in, in quantity, so that every legislator will be able to have them, which is very, very important. And most important in terms of having public forums. Uh, tomorrow I'm in London to meet with the uh, politicians in London who are setting up a whole series, series of lectures of people who know Arabic, who know this material, and again, there always has to be openness on our part as people who, who deal with honest inquiry that maybe there will be a change, we always are looking for that change. But again, we deal with reality, and in 1969, when I was at the University of Wisconsin, we had a group called Israel is Real. And that was our way of, of expressing what was happening in, in, in Israel. Israel is real, it's a real place. And Sarah Stern, to my right, has done wonders as we pick up her, uh, her, her resonating work in Israel in terms of bringing the reality of Israel to this, to the Capitol Hill, and she should be commended for that.